God, we, we rise before you. We can't imagine that moment when the King of Kings will be crowned and we'll be there. The children's story took us there. What the choir just sang took us there. We want to be there. We have a few moments left. Please engage these moments. Address our minds, move our hearts, and stir up our spirits. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I have one word from the Bible for you who have just sung for us. Wow. That was absolutely heavenly. Thank you, Academies, for coming from all over the Great Lakes states. We are so honored to have you. I hope you all come back to Andrews University. That is what I'm hoping. Come on. Come on back. You know that song, O Day of Peace That Dimly Shines. Thank you, Steve Zork and Gabriel on the keyboard. I scribbled the words down. Then enemies shall learn to love, for all the earth shall know the Lord. What a message. Bless you. Thank you for singing with us and for us. I want to think about war for a minute. Come on. I got a, I got a, a weapon right here, and so if it's okay with you, I'll just come and reach under this piano and pull it out. It's from a friend of mine named Errol Prentice. And we're talking about the real deal here, folks. I don't know if you can recognize it from where you are. And Errol told me, you got to put your hand through this so that if you drop it, and oh boy, I do not want to drop it. This is one expensive piece of equipment. No, this is backwards. <laughs> do you know what this is? Yeah, I'm mean, not even sure right now what it is. I don't <laughs> oh, there it is. I got it. I got it. Yeah, this is a bow. This is, this is a real live bow. We're, this is not little, uh, you know, cowboys and Indians bow. This, this is the real deal. I'm not going to tell you how much it cost. But Earl has become just a pro. He's, a, he's the champion leader of our Pathfinders, and he's been teaching archery. The reason I have this bow in my hand is because for a few moments I want to think about war, and you'll see how it fits in in just a second. I have more to tell you about this, but I, I got to reach into my pocket because people say that when it comes to war, there are four options, all right? Four options. These are responses you can make in a war. Here we go. Option number one, offense. Come on. You know what that is. Option number two, defense. Ooh, you know what that is. Option number three, detente. Ooh, what is that? We'll get to that in a moment. And option number four, desertion, just running away. I want to go to that little French word that's sitting there, detente. Do you know what that old, it's, it's, it's from old French. Do you know what the word means? I'll tell you. De means it negates it. It takes something away. And tendre, tendre, yeah, I'm wrong word, tendre, means tension. So it's old French when they had crossbows. You remember crossbows? The word means to take away the tension of the bowstring. No more tension. And you know what? If I release this, it's 80 pounds, by the way, 80 pounds of pressure right here. So when Errol pulls his hand back, it's 80 pounds worth. Do you know I scribbled this down in between services because I, he didn't share this with me till, till then. This, this bow is able to shoot an arrow 280 yards. That's almost three football fields. It has a super duper, super duper electronic, don't point it at anybody, said okay, a super duper electronic uh, laser scope. It's... One of these arrows travels at 300 feet per second. That's an entire football field. Unbelievable. But detente means you, 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 let, you, you lower the tension. These become floppy and flabby. And that's why uh, in diplomacy, 
we, uh, French is the language of diplomacy. The, the diplomat said, hey, we got two superpowers here. They're not getting along. We got to find out a way. It's not peace on earth like you're just saying yet. We got to find a way to work it out. And they called it detente. detente. We're going to lower the tensions on the planet. So how many strategies are there when it comes to uh, life? Winston Churchill, the, the great intrepid leader of the British Empire during World War II, during, during those dark days, he sent a message to, to one of his admirals, Admiral Lord Lewis Mountbatten, Secretary of the Admiralty, that would be the Department of Navy. He sent this message. He said, all right, you want to talk about strategy in the war? Here are my orders to you. You are to plan for the offensive. In your headquarters, you will never think defensively. You're saying, yo, right, well, that's great for military, but how about life strategy? I want to suggest to you, and I'm going to uh, put a line in front of your eyes in just a moment. I want to suggest that there's only one strategy, even in life. In fact, if you open your Bible, and I'm going to put this down because we're going to come back to it in just a second. If you open your Bible to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, so Paul, the a greater leader than Winston Churchill, in my humble opinion, intrepid, vagabond preacher, evangelist, and missionary, greatest Christian who ever lived. Paul's writing to a young protege of his named Timothy, and he gives him how many of those four options are you going to take? Well, this would be good for us. Let's find out. First Timothy chapter 6, we'll pick it up in verse 11 that will run into that one line. Offense, Churchill says. We want offense. Forget defense. Okay? Here we go. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11, but you, man of God, woman of God, teen of God, people of God, but you flee from all this. He's just been talking about greed and, and the love of money and, and uh, covetousness. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Now, here it comes. Fight the good fight of faith. Of those four options, which do you think that is? It's only one. It's the first one. What's the first one? Offense. You have no other option. And by the way, that's true for you and me. No other option. Offense. But this really gets dramatic when, you look, when, you, when we take this line and we put it in the Greek. And so these won't be Greek letters. I've uh, transferred them into to English, but it will sound like the Greek. Agonizu ton kalon agona. Let's just take these two words here, agonizu, agona. Can you think of an English word that kind of sounds like that? Agonizu, agona. Say it fast, agonizu, agona. What's the word? Can you hear a word? Yeah, you got it. Agonize and agony. Fight the good fight of faith means agonize the good agony. Come on. No, I'm serious. That's what it's saying here. Agonize, agony. I point all of this out to us so that we don't think this little one-line uh, insertion at the end of his letter to Timothy is some sort of throwaway, you know, just a little bit of a namby-pamby advice. You, you've heard the line, when the going gets tough, how does it end? When the going gets tough, the tough get going. Yeah, but what's that mean, really? The word Paul chooses has life and death written all over it. He's talking about fight, agony. Agonize. Hey, wait a minute. Some of you sitting here right now, man, you got such beautiful faces. I couldn't tell what's in your heart right now if I tried. But behind all of that, uh, all of that manicured look of yours, there's some people here right now going through agony. They are agonizing to the depths. They are broken. We show up at church and show up on Academy campus. What is it? Yeah, hey, yo, bro, how are you? Psh, psh, psh. High five. How are you doing? Great. Nobody ever knows. One of you here, a bunch of us here, agony. I got a young friend. He's younger than my son. He is going right now battling for his life through the agony, fighting, agonizu. He is fighting the dreadful enemy of cancer. It is a mortal battle. And he's in it to the hilt. Agony. Agonizing. Nah, 
This is not, this is not just a little, a little P.S. at the end of a very important letter. No, this, this is the whole letter. This is life and death. And you know why it's life and death? Because when, when you agonize, when you feel agony, the stakes are huge. They are absolutely high. What's amazing to me is that what Paul is really writing here is this, if you put it in the, the English translation, agonize the good agony. You say, how could, how could it possibly be ever true that there is such a thing as good agony? The only way I can think about it, because it's, it's obviously what it says, agonize the good agony. The only way I can think it would be good is if the cause that you're engaged in is worth dying for. If it's not worth dying for, I mean, please, who cares? But if it's worth dying for, hmm. I'm watching these soldiers in the Ukraine. What, what, we just finished, what, one, one year in Ukraine. Unbelievable. Tragic, tragic war, in my humble uh, opinion. But when the war correspondent comes up to those soldiers, young guys, already battle-hardened and an interpreter standing there, and I'm listening to the English saying, how long are you going to fight? We will, we will fight. We will agonize to the last man. Because that's the way a soldier fights. You're all in. And by the way, I'm just thinking, if you and I don't have a cause worth dying for, really, we're going to end up with a life not worth living for. I mean, come on, do you have, what's, what's the cause? I know we're teens, everybody in the front here, and good on you. You're strategically placed, by the way, and I'm so glad you are on the campus as you are. You are strategically placed because teens have an inner, an inner energy that enables you in the face of others who are not standing as you are to jump up and say, I do, I will. Count me in. So I'm asking you teens up front, what is, what is it that you have found worth dying for? Have you found anything yet? Too young, huh? No, some of you already are, are honing in on it. Agonize the good agony. Which is why, now I'm going to drill down a little deeper here. I need you to hang on here. Which is why... The biggest threat to freedom in the world. I'm going to say this. The biggest threat to the church, all right? Here we are. We're all church right now. The biggest threat to the church is non-engagement, which doesn't mean you renounce the cause that the church stands for. Uh-uh. Not at all. You simply stop defending it. You no, you no longer engage it. You no longer battle it. Even as a teen. Come on. You're critical. But nah, I'm not in it right now. I get in it later, maybe. No. What's threatening culture and church? Non-engagement. Spiritual non-engagement. And now I'm really drilling down. Don't, don't, don't leave me now. Spiritual non-engagement is the fruit of our valueless culture where everybody's preference needs to be tolerated and defend it. That's the culture today. Or at least allow a place at the table. Come on, you can sit here. Come on. No, 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 no. You know what? That may feel like bold equality, but in my book, it's feckless timidity. Say, well, hey, it doesn't matter what you believe. It's that old jingle on, on social media. Have you heard it? Nobody's right, nobody's wrong. We simply have to get along. You ever heard that one? Nobody's right. Nobody's wrong. We simply have to get along. Nobody's right. Nobody's wrong. We simply have to get along. Come on. Not on your life. Are you kidding? When we have a mortal enemy who has his arrow in place and all he needs is for permission in a heartbeat, that arrow is released right through you. This is no namby-pamby stuff. Come on. Nobody's right. Nobody's wrong. We simply have to get along. So here's a question for your academy, where you're from, and for my academy, where, where I'm from, and for my university, where I'm from. How long shall we lower the moral bar, all right? How long shall we lower? How far shall we lower the moral bar? 
Hmm. How much are you willing to compromise in your friendships? I was talking with a student uh, this last week. And she said, I'm really embarrassed. I said, what are you embarrassed about? She said, I went on a date. Yeah? Well, there's nothing embarrassing about that. Yeah, and she, the guy said, hey, can we end with a, you know, just a little? And she said, I looked at him and said, none in your life. He says, what's the matter with you? You know what? That's, that's where this comes in. What she was facing is, whoa, whoa. This is a wonderful day. This is perfect. She comes to the end, and so far, so good. It's tight. But she's faced with a choice now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to loosen the poundage on this bowstring. I'm going to let it just get floppy and flaccid and flabby. I just let it, just for a few moments. Then I'll get back to, ooh. This isn't just about campuses. This isn't just about institutions. This is about you and me. Because we all hold the, we all hold the bow in our hands. And the bowstring's tautness, T-A-U-T, the bowstring's tension is up to us. We have the option actually to do detente. Detente is when you say, hey, 80 pounds, forget it. Ooh, floppy, floppy, that's about what I need. You got to be kidding me. Can you imagine a war with floppy? And you got the enemy coming straight at you, and he has 300, he has 300 feet per second on his. Shh, and you're pulling this thing, and there is nothing to it. We're dead meat. We have to keep it taut. Ah, oh, come on, guys. Detente. Turns out this loosening of the bowstring is actually, comp is, is actually achieved by compromise. That's it. It's the word compromise. For our mortal enemy, that's the only way he wins. Come on, Dwight, come on. Loosen up, boy. Come on, it's just a party. This is just tonight. It'll be over. Come with us, chicken. Loosen the bow. I'm not loosening the bow. Yeah. In fact, you, you'll be surprised. The word detente is not found in Scripture. Neither is the word compromise. Oh, there's one close to it. Oh, what was that word? Laodicea. What's Laodicea? I'm half hot and half cold. That's compromise. Apparently the church, the culture at the very end of the human history is Laodicea. Compromise. One foot in, one foot out. Flabby. The enemy's bearing down on you. You aim and there's, there, is no, there is nothing left. You let the line down. You loosened it up. Wrong move, girl. Wrong time. Keep it taught. Keep it taught. You have nothing to apologize, guys. Man, oh man, singing the way you sing, you have nothing to apologize. You got steel in that spine of yours, and I love it. God loves it. No compromise, no detente. Nope. We have one strategy fight the good fight of faith. That's it. Fight the good fight of faith. Non engagement, not into it. Detente, not into it. Compromise, nope. Here I stand. I'm standing, and I'm not moving. It's the only way you're going to win. Paul writes to this young Timothy, fight, agonize the good agony. Of course it'll cost you some. Think it's going to be easy? <laughs> you kid, you signed up for this. I didn't sign you up. Once you sign up, you're in, girl. Boy, once you sign up, you're in. No backing out. Oh, you can back out, but who would? You're on a winning team already. Can you imagine quitting a winning team, you basketball jocks? I want to join a losing team. I hate playing with winners. Are you crazy? Why would you join a losing team when you're on the winning team? Come on. Jesus is right. No, no woman, no man can serve two masters. You love the one, hate the other, hate the one, love the other. You cannot serve God and Satan. Impossible. Yeah. So, hey, listen, there's been a lot of talk lately about revival. Did you, have you heard about it on your campuses? Everybody's heard about it in America, I'm sure. 
A lot of talk about revival these days, ever since the news started reporting it. In fact, we talked about revival last Sabbath. Yep. And since then, I've received emails and phone conversations and the like. And what is becoming clear to me, listen up to this. What's becoming clear to me is that there is some confusion over the meaning or definition of revival. What are you talking about, Dwight? Well, some people are combing their personal recollection or collective history recollection, and they're describing evidences of what's happened in the past, so we ought to be thankful. We've got it in the past. Hey, listen, listen, listen. I, I, I receive every one of those with great joy. Thank you for telling me about that. It happened once. But here's the deal. The kind of revival I'm referring to and many people are longing for the kind of revival we need here at Pioneer, the kind of revival we need here at Andrews University is a revival that leads to reformation. Reformation. It's not just a flash in the pan. Way we had a revival. Good. What's next? No. The only revival now that's left on the agenda is a revival that leads to reformation. It doesn't matter to me what's happening on another campus right now. That is immaterial to me. What we need here is a revival that sparks reformation. And by that, by that I mean a revival that, that leads to changed hearts, transformed lives. And I'm talking about my heart and my life, and I'm talking about yours as well. That's what we need. A change in our thinking around here. A change in our behaving. Hey, listen, Paul's on death row. We looked at this line last week. Paul's on death row, and he has the bitter pain. Talking about agony, one of his closest associates has deserted him. I'm talking about the fourth option in war, which is to run, baby, run. That's what happened to Paul. Let me put the line back on the screen. Demas has deserted me. Paul's on death row. Demas has deserted me because he loved this world. You can't believe it. You run because you love the world? He did. And it's broken my heart. And by the way, it's that love of the world that's killing us around here. It's killing us on your campus, whatever campus you're from. It's that love of the world. What are you talking about, Dwight? Well, I'm talking about a, a, a reformation that means we abandon the love of the world. We abandon this detente, this compromise with a fallen culture. We, th th there is a change in our lifestyles. There is a change in our sexual lifestyles. That's what I'm talking about. A change in the way we do business around here. A change in the way we treat one another around here. My heart breaks when I get an email that's gone to 500 other people. Some people feel that that's their solution. Just keep forwarding emails, blanking them. My heart breaks. Is that Jesus' way? You really think we... We've tightened the bowstring here, or have we loosened it so it doesn't matter how I get my word out as long as my word gets out? You can't, you've got to be kidding me. No, a revival, a change in the way we do business, a change in the way we treat each other. That's the revival and reformation I need. That's the reformation and transformation we need, all of us, all seven of your campuses plus ours. A transformation that means becoming more and more like Jesus, like his strong love for people. Oh, Jesus loved people. <laughs> he always was standing up, by the way, for the marginalized, the, the disenfranchised, and the alienated. That's, that's being like Jesus. Jesus stood up for holiness. You stand up for holiness. You say, hey, you know, hey, come on, boy. My, my string is taut. Nope. That's being like Jesus. Jesus' devotion to his Father, getting alone with him, Abba, Father. Yeah, that's what it means to be like Jesus. Be like Jesus, this my song, in the home and in the throng. Be like Jesus all day long, I would be like Jesus. That's the revival that leads to reformation, to be like Jesus. Because, you see, it always keeps coming back to Jesus. I've got to show you this before I sit down. It always comes back to Jesus. You see, I left off part of this. That, that, that line we've been looking at is fight the good fight. But there's actually more to it. Of the faith. And that's from the NIV. 
translates the article here to make sure that we see it. Fight the good fight of the faith. Of the faith of what? Of the faith of whom? Whose faith are you talking about? If you're a generation at the end of time, I'll tell you whose faith we're talking about. The book of Revelation is absolutely clear. People living, teens living at the end of time. You'll identify them right here. Here we go. Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. This is from the David Bentley Hart rendition or translation of the New Testament. Here is the endurance of the holy ones who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. They keep the faith of Jesus. Fight the good fight of faith, of the faith. Whose faith? The faith of Jesus. Come on. It's all about Jesus, I'm telling you. You want revival and reformation around here? Me too. Then it it comes back to all about Jesus. That's it. It's all about Jesus. You won't get a revival without Jesus. Oh, that little classic, Steps to Christ. I got to share this with you. I gave this to a friend of mine. We had lunch a week and a half ago. He's a minister, pastor, been here for... 15 years, for 10 years, he's been watching every week right here. Another denomination. Steps to Christ. I gave him a copy of this. Look at this. Uh, Steps to Christ. It is by communion with Jesus daily, hourly, by abiding in him that we are to grow in grace. He is not only the author, but the finisher of our faith too. Why? Because it's the faith of Jesus. That's how you win. The faith of Jesus. That's your weapon right there. He is not only the author, but the finisher of our faith. It is Christ first and last and always. I'm telling you, that's revival that leads to reformation. When Christ is first and last and always, you got got the seeds of a, of a, a revolution, a revival that turns into a reformation, that turns into a revolution. And you're the generation. I'm looking at you. Teens, you're what we need. Don't you let anybody sell you short. We have to have you, and we have to have you sold out. We, we can't have you with your bowstring just slackened and when you come here. No, no, no. We need you with a bowstring taut, tight, tension, steel in your spine. That's who we need. If you're not going to be that way, find another school. We need you sold out, and you are it. When I heard you singing, man, I just said, Jesus, what a platform full of teens. Can you believe it? Handpicked by God himself. You're it. I'm proud of you. I can tell just by looking into your face. I'm proud of you. And the best is yet to come. Don't you ever back down. Keep it taut. The best is yet to come. Yeah. Fight the good fight of the faith of Jesus. Agonize the good agony of the agony and faith of Jesus. One thing I know, revival and reformation around here will have Jesus' fingerprints and Jesus' blood drops all over it. I am now with one other place the word agony appears. And I want you to open your Bible. I'm not putting it on the screen. Open your Bible to Luke chapter 23. Pull your little phone out. You got it. And uh, turn to Luke 22. Luke 22. I'm going to read this story and then I'll sit down. Luke 22. It's Thursday night late. The upper room is behind. The Last Supper is now finis. And picked up in verse 39. And Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives. He's going to the Gethsemane, his favorite uh, nighttime prayer spot. He went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. And on reaching the place, he said to them, pray. By the way, you want, you want revival and reformation and revolution? Three R's? Pray. There's no way around it. Of course it's through Jesus. But pray, he's telling his closest companions. Pray that you will not fall into temptation. Keep that bowstring taut. Don't loosen your bowstring. The enemy has his sights on you. He'll kill you tonight. Pray that you will not fall into temptation. Jesus withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them. He knelt down and he prayed. Red letters in my Bible. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. And just like that, an angel from heaven, verse 43, appeared to him and strengthened him. What's going on here? 
Oh, I will put the last verse on the screen because I need you to see where the Greek word is. Here it is, final verse 44, and being in anguish, here's the Greek word, agonia, agonize the good agony. Jesus does it first himself. You're not treading a pathway that Jesus has not already walked ahead of you. And being in anguish, agonia, he prayed more earnestly, intensely, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. There it is. You just read it. The basis, the bedrock for revival and reformation around here and on the campus where you live. The blood of Jesus and the sacrifice of Jesus. That's what ignites what we're desperately praying for. And you're it. Keep that bowstring taut. Don't you go home with it all f- flabby and flaccid. No. And the best is yet to come for your campus and for mine as well. There's one prayer to pray. I'll put it on the screen. Just memorize this prayer. Memorize this prayer. Jesus, I pray this prayer all the time in my dark little prayer room. Jesus, Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy on me. Jesus, Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy on me. Jesus, Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Have mercy on my campus. Have mercy on my teachers. Have mercy on my peers. Have mercy on my administrators. Jesus, Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy on me. You just keep repeating it. You'll get it. You just keep repeating it. Jesus, Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Let's pray. Oh, God, Lord Jesus, we don't want, we don't want slack bowstrings. No. We want it to be taut, tense, in your hands, all that you need to let your arrow take the enemy out. That's all we ask. Jesus, Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, Have mercy on us here and there and everywhere. Have mercy on us. And we will praise you. Yes, we will. As the choir just sang, we will praise you in that place. Our enemies are no more. And peace and love in the Lord forever and ever. Amen. We've been really blessed by the financial support that comes from our viewers. And we've made a conscious decision, and you know this is true, not to continually appeal to you for that support. But the fact is, as everyone in the industry will tell you, we need to be making constant upgrades to our technology. Well, I'll be leaving Pioneer soon. I'm confident that God has a plan to continue growing the media ministry here with the new leader. The new lead pastor will need your support in prayer and financially. If God has blessed you and you'd like to further the work of this ministry, we invite you to partner with us. Every bit of your gift goes to the mission of blessing your community and our world. You can donate on our website. Here's the website, pmchurch.org. Then click giving up at the top and then select media ministry, or you can call the number, 877-HIS-WILL. Again, that number is 877 and then the two words, His Will. My prayer is that the God who has blessed you will continue to pour into your life the gifts of his joy and his hope. So thank you in advance for your gracious generosity.